Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, a program where we take a look at the Word of God and Scripture as understood through the lens of our sacred tradition. And of course, we'd love to have you be part of the program. You can do so by adding your comments and questions, calling up during the live broadcast, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number, if you are in North America, is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside of North America, you can still call, but not using that number. won't work. So call country code 1, area code 205-271-271. 0. You can also send us questions by email, writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com, or follow us and participate with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Today, we're going to talk more about obedience and actually doing what God asks us to do, even though we'd rather not do it, as well as understanding a way to pray through the passion of Christ. Now, we cover this in my book, which is called How to Listen When God is Speaking, a guide for modern day Catholics. And you can get that at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 8. 1833. All right, so we are in this chapter that takes a look at the uh, what we should expect from prayers, chapter seven of the book. And in this section, um, I, I like I'd like to use some of the own events of my own life. Um, one of them was something that I did and happened back when I was in, I think, uh, graduate school in the 80s. I used to go out to San Diego and give Bible studies in the summertime when school was out at Vanderbilt. I'd go to where it's a little bit more pleasant weather. Nashville, Tennessee can be pretty hot and muggy. So I went to San Diego. My dad and my grandparents and aunt lived out there. So it was a great chance to visit them and also do a lot of studying in a very pleasant environment and teach some Bible studies, which was great. It was a great opportunity to figure out a little bit more of what I wanted to say, and I could work on my dissertation topic uh, at the time. Well, uh, one of the things that you know happened while I was there, I had great friends, oftentimes would stay with them and in San Diego, and they used to go to this charismatic prayer group. And on the first Friday, they had mass for this group at one of the parishes in San, inside San Diego. I was asked to preach a sermon, and the topic was on the way that the Lord our God calls us to do things we don't really want to do. And that was all fine, a good, good topic, all of us get asked to do those kind of things. It's part of life, right? Well, as the evening went on, the people in the prayer group would get together with various individuals who wanted personal prayer. And one of the friends I stayed with was, you know, praying for these folks. Her husband was actually, uh, he fell asleep on one of the pews, so he was just taking a nap, uh, as he often did. <laughs> and 
I just wanted to go to the Eucharistic Chapel and pray and reflect on the gospel and be attentive. And I was actually using the five P's of prayer that we talked about in the previous chapter. And I was in this dark, quiet place room of this very peaceful church with people praying in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, content as could be, when one of the ladies from one of the prayer teams came up to me and asked if I would mind joining her and the other folks in praying for the many people who had come to pray for healing. I told her, quite frankly, I do mind, but I'll do it anyway. I had just preached a sermon about doing things that the Lord asks of us and that come from the needs, even though I don't feel like it. And so I had to live my own words. It's one of the great things about preaching is that you get a chance to be hoisted up on your own petard and be forced to start living what you preach. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, So I got up to the sanctuary and I saw that there was a very large group of people and there was no way to get through praying over each individual uh, one at a time. Sometimes they were praying for 15, 20 minutes, half hour each individual. It would have taken to three in the morning. And, And of course I had mass the next morning too. So one of the things I did was invite the people to come closer to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. They came toward the sanctuary. Many of them were at the altar rail and such. And if you want to get warm, you come close to the campfire. If you want Christ to come and heal you, get close to Him. And this is one of the advantages of praying before the Blessed Sacrament. And I reminded them, something we talked about in an earlier chapter, that being in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament is the same as being with Him as He was in Galilee. It's the same Lord Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. He's completely there. And we're just in His presence. We should get close to Him. And then... It came to me as we were praying. Isaiah, the prophet, had a wonderful passage in Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 5. And he predicted back in the, um, this, this would go back to the 540s B.C., So it's over 540 years before the birth of Christ and even longer, almost 570 years before the public ministry of our Lord. And in that passage it said about the Messiah that he was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed, for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Now, this is a very important text. It's important enough to be quoted by the first letter of St. Peter in chapter 2, verse 24, where St. Peter spoke of Jesus, saying, and I quote, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. 
by his stripes you are healed. And the word stripes is another word for the bruises in the prophet. And the reason that they use that kind of terminology is that it's in reference to our Lord being scourged. The whip would have formed stripes across his body, especially at first. Later on, it would they, they hit him so often that the flesh would start to be pulled off of his body because they oftentimes added little pieces of broken bone or lead balls into the end of the whip in order to cause more bleeding. And quite frequently, that kind of torture led to death. So St. Peter recognizes that it's Jesus who fulfilled that. And then when we go to the Gospels, take a look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, where it's where in reference to a number of miracles our Lord had begun to do right after the Sermon on the Mount, that Matthew gives a comment, uh, sort of an editorial comment, saying that these healings were to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now, obviously, the apostles, witnesses of our Lord's suffering, understood his very tortured passion to be a fulfillment of Isaiah 53. And they saw that as the innocent Son of God received all these torments, it looked to the people as if, well, he's being punished as he deserves and that God is unhappy with him. There's a mentality that comes especially from the book of Deuteronomy in chapters 26 and 27, where a long series of curses and a somewhat shorter series of blessings are laid out. If you obey the law of God, you get these blessings. But if you break the law of God, you get these curses, one of which, by the way, was to be hung on a tree, which is what happened to our Lord. That's one of the reasons that the Sanhedrin wanted to hand Jesus over to Pilate so he could be hung from a tree and die the death of the accursed. And that also fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that he would be deemed or counted as cursed and that his sufferings would be seen as a curse. This would make it even worse. And yet, the prophet more importantly points out that this suffering is precisely what leads to the Messiah's victory. And it is precisely his suffering that brings us healing, that he does what's known as vicarious suffering. He suffers in our place. He takes the punishment our sins deserve. And he takes this punishment to heal us of the effects of our sin, because it's not only the sins. We do things wrong, and those are acts of our will, and those sinful acts of the will need to be forgiven. However, sin also causes a variety of pains. It causes suffering. Some of the suffering due to sin is psychological. 
It's emotional. Again, not that every single psychological uh, problem is the direct result of sins I've committed. Some people, again, thinking like Deuteronomy 26 and 27, jump to the conclusion that everything they suffer is the result of their own sin. And this is something we have to be cautious about. Um, maybe we deserve punishment for our sin, but a lot of times our suffering is not directly related to a sin we committed, and it sometimes is related to a sin somebody else does. For instance, I remember in certain places where corporations polluted the drinking water or the land, and the residents became sick with cancers. That's something that is, that's not the, a punishment for the sins of the people, but for the people who made money dumping chemicals into the water or land. So it can be other people's sins, and sometimes it's just a result of the way that the world is fallen and we suffer the consequences of the you know, original sin. And it's not a personal sin by us, by a corporation, or by somebody else. Some sins are directly connected to our behavior. If you get a hangover after you get drunk, there's a direct link between the bad behavior and the pain of the hangover, but it's not always that simple. Sometimes yes, sometimes other people sin, sometimes it's just the fallenness of the world. But Christ suffered in order to bring his healing into these circumstances, into our own pains. And again, that's why Matthew, you know, makes that direct link in his gospel of chapter 8, verse 17. It was our infirmities he bore. And as we take a look at the power of Christ's suffering and death to forgive us and heal us, as I was in that sanctuary with the various people coming up for prayer, I reminded them of this passage, and I reminded them of the importance of letting, having faith in Christ that He can heal us of us, and that as we pray in, in the name of Christ, we can pray for healing, and but we pray for it as it comes from the power of Christ's suffering and death, and that we should make this at the forefront of our thought as we pray for that, our healing. I'll continue telling a little bit more about this, uh, but we'll take a break now and come back and uh, finish this up and then come to your questions and comments, so please stay with us. So I've been relating how I was at this charismatic prayer group at Offered Mass and was asked to pray, reluctantly accepting the request, but I was asked to pray for people who were sick. And I reminded them of the passage in Isaiah that says that we are, by His stripes we are healed, and that He took our afflictions and our transgressions upon Him that his suffering is there to heal us of sin and of the effects of sin 
in a way that the sin uh, harms us psychologically and physically. And I was very much reminded as I began praying with them, I was reminded of a, some teachings I had learned from retreats given to priests by Archbishop Sheen. And he said how we should find our own biography, I would find our life story in the passion of Christ, in his suffering. And so I prayed uh, with this group of people and reminded myself and them that as we address God the Father, that we are reminded he gave us his son. He therefore holds no good thing from us and that this is an infinite gift. Christ is truly God and therefore is infinite with no limitations. And therefore, no sin that we commit is stronger than his death and suffering on the cross. And we also trust that nothing in creation is more powerful than his cross. And that we always have to begin by thanking him for the salvation he has won for us and has freely bestowed upon us. And then I went through various aspects of the Passion, beginning with the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Our Lord went there to pray, and he desired the comfort of being with his Heavenly Father, as well as the comfort of being with his friends. And this is something all of us do. We like to have support when we're in the midst of suffering. That's why it's good to visit people in the hospital. And the Lord also stated that he did not really want to suffer the pain of his coming death. He didn't want to suffer. He said to his father, Father, if it be your will, take this cup away from me. And cup in the Old Testament refers to the cup of suffering. And it's used in the Psalms a number of times that way. And as he prayed, he not wanting to suffer, he also prayed that he was willing to accept the will of his Abba, his father, and that he was there to do what the Father wanted. And yet, it's, this is where he begins the, the healing power, because he's still given the cup and he has to take it. it just like sometimes each and every one of us has to take on various kinds of difficulty and suffering. Sometimes our own sicknesses, sometimes caring for those who are sick. That's very important. And think about how, as he's in Gethsemane, one of the twelve apostles just ordained one of the first twelve bishops at the Last Supper who had just received the body and blood of Christ, one of those twelve comes up to Jesus and betrays him with a kiss. And think on that a bit. This is a very important source of healing. For those of you who have experienced divorce, when your spouse betrays you and leaves you for another, or when your children leave you, or in the case of many children today, an incredibly large number, parents abandon them. 
And it's in meeting Christ in that suffering, in that pain, that we can find healing, that He won for us a healing from the betrayals with a kiss that so many people have experienced in divorce and family breakup or when friends abandoned them. This is extremely important. And he's then taken to the court of the high priest where the head of his apostles, Peter, the first pope, three times denies that he even knows Jesus. Now, he had said he would suffer with Christ. Christ knew better. But when Peter denies even knowing him, that is already a, a sign of you know, pain for him, that that is experienced as a rejection. And all that our Lord does is look at Peter intently the kind of word that they use to look at him, is to look intently. And what any of us who have experienced that kind of abandonment can do is ask our Lord to come into our own lives and experience healing for all those. Then there is the uh, next stage where he experiences the stripes by which we are healed. This is when he's on trial with Pontius Pilate. And Pilate says, I have nothing wrong with this guy, but I'll go have him scourged. Now, this injustice to have a man horribly tormented with this scourging when he didn't do anything, and it's a sort of a toss off gift to the crowd because he can't find anything wrong with Christ. And there are a number of things going on there that can heal us. Again, every human being experiences injustice. And people also experience being punished unjustly for no reason. Think throughout history how many uh, people were slaves and they were beaten. Today we have even more slaves than we used to. There are more slaves in the human trafficking industry than there were slaves in, before the Civil War, just numerically. And they also have all kinds of, uh, you know, physical torments. But then think also of those people who are abused by their husbands, physically abused, or by their wives. There's an underreporting of men who are physically abused, and people who are emotionally abused, children who are physically and or emotionally or sexually abused. The, this kind of abuse is something Christ wants to heal, and it's by His scourging that He heals that and gives us a source of healing. But then, for those people who are suffering from skin cancer and various terrible rashes and eczema and wide variety of jaundice, psoriasis, these various uh, skin disorders, this, you ask for the Lord to heal it, by the power of the scourging of his flesh. But then also, consider those people who commit sins of the flesh, that their flesh becomes an occasion of temptation. Well, the scourging of his flesh is also a source of strength to overcome the sins of the flesh and of healing for the effects, the shame and the embarrassment that go with all of those. And this is where we ask our Lord to help us. Then the soldiers took it upon themselves. Pontius Pilate didn't tell the soldiers to crown him with thorns. They just took that on their own in order to mock 
Jesus and say, all hail King of the Jews, when they put this crown of thorns on him. And then they took a reed and beat him over the head, pounding the thorns into him. And think about all of those people who get mocked. You know, for all kinds of reasons, sometimes because of their race, their religion, sexual preference, all that kind of thing, that these things over which they have minimal control become the basis for mockery. And Christ's experience of mockery here and at other points is a source of healing for that kind of bullying and mockery. And then there's also the sin of pride. You know, a lot of us have pride for false claims or loose claims, or things we never really accomplished. Christ really is the King of Israel and the King of the world, the King of kings, and they mock him. And this becomes a source of healing for our pride. But also, People who are suffering from a variety of you know, migraine headaches and brain cancers and other disorders of the head, they can also be healed of that. Or people who are dis suffering from mental disorders and disabilities, that this can be a source of healing of some of the pain that they might suffer for that. And then we can also think about Jesus carrying the cross. He carries the cross through the streets. How many people feel like they've just been burdened with life, that they're carrying the world on their shoulders? Christ carried the sins of the world on his shoulders. And this is something worth for people who can experience healing when they feel like everything depends on them, they have to work so much, nobody appreciates them and what they do. But also for healing of their uh, physical shoulders, their back, slip disc. And then consider that when he gets to Calvary, he's stripped naked and they take off his clothes and divide them. And this is a source of healing for those who suffer because of their own poverty, those who are robbed. A friend of mine was just robbed of his vehicle yesterday. Um, we see people, mobs of people robbing others. And there are other people who feel shame because their bodies are not you know, meeting the ideal of beauty, and they feel shame at that. And Christ's being stripped can heal them of that too. And then when he's hung on the cross, nails are put into his hands and feet, and he loses his freedom. How many people feel stuck in their jobs, stuck in their homes, stuck with the kids, stuck with bills, stuck with all kinds of problems? And Christ was literally stuck of the cross, and at those times we feel the loss of freedom, his loss of freedom by being nailed to the cross is a source of healing for that. And that he also gets mocked, why don't you come down from the cross? You know, in the midst of his sufferings, they, they mock him. Again, this is a source of healing. And one of my favorite parts of the crucifixion to relate to people's difficulties, very important today, is they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. This was a painkiller. They give it to him and he refuses it. And one of the very important elements of that is that this is the source of grace to heal people from their addiction to alcohol and to drugs. They take alcohol and drugs because they have so many problems. They want to deaden the pain of the problems of life, their loneliness and all the other things. And Christ was in his pain and he refuses the painkiller but he's winning for the alcoholic and the drug addicts a grace to say no 
to the substance they are abusing. And then finally, as he's dying, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now he's quoting Psalm 22, which I urge you to read. But he's also uttering something that a lot of people feel. They feel abandoned by God. But he reaches by making that prayer. He's reaching out to them to heal them of that abandonment. He's with them in their suffering. And this is something that is a great source of strength. And finally, he dies, dealing with something every single one of us will have to do. All of us will have to die at some point. And he's with us in that moment of death so that we can also experience this great change to, from this life to eternity. And he wants us to do it well. And we can go through this and various other aspects of the passion of Christ and ask him to give us his healing, to make us strong, and to forgive us our sins by each one of these different kinds of sufferings he endured. We can apply it to our lives and our spiritual life. This is a very, very important thing. And I hope that this would be something that would be helpful in your own prayers. All right, let's go to some of your questions. I'm going to start off with an email that we have. I don't have a call yet, but I have an email from Ron who lives in Lakewood Ranch, Florida. And he writes, uh, Father Pacwa, if we fulfill the conditions of a plenary indulgence and ask God to apply it to the soul of a loved one, does that mean we no longer have to pray for that soul since it is now in heaven with God? Ron, well, uh, I would assume so. I would assume so that if that, that person, uh, you know, had that openness to receiving that grace, yes. I oftentimes continue praying for my dead relatives and friends. And I do so with the sense that if they are in heaven, apply this to one of the needy souls that has nobody to pray for them. Uh, so I don't mind continuing on praying for them. But yeah, we can assume that they're in heaven with God. But I keep on making those offerings because there are many other people in purgatory and that act of charity to pray for them is a good thing. And, you know, we can be assured that if we help these souls get to heaven, they'll be praying for us in purgatory, but also when they get to heaven, they'll be especially praying for us and they'll be there to meet us, when, uh, God, when we get there too. All right, uh, I went a little bit long, so we'll take a break and come back with more of your questions and emails, so please stay with us. Right, welcome back, and we are taking a look at some of your emails. And I think we have an email from David. Uh, it says, Father Pacwa, the sin of blasphemy is not quite clear as it was in the Old Testament. My understanding is that it is a grave sin against God, which points to the commandment, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. The reason I'm asking this is because as a graduate from Catholic University of America, I came across a rather disturbing depiction of George Floyd as Christ in the Pieta by Michelangelo. From my understanding, man is not God, and therefore this depiction of a man replacing Jesus who in the Pieta came off the cross and is created by the Blessed Virgin Mary is blasphemy. Am I correct? Hmm. You know, I, I have not seen 
that image. Um, I'm sure the artist um, was trying to, that there's a certain way that one could understand, um, you know, that Mr. Floyd had suffered like Christ had. Um, and I don't know that he meant blasphemy. I don't know what the artist meant. I haven't seen this, so it's hard for me to comment. Uh, but it doesn't, it's certainly not something I would have depicted. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, when Michelangelo uh, did make his Pieta, uh, he certainly would have had some gentleman as a model that he carved. Uh, he, he used, a lot of artists use models. Um, I, I, I suspect that there is something of a statement about trying to understand, somewhat like my prayer, understand the suffering of people today in light of the suffering of Christ, uh, to say that Mr. Floyd is, um, you know, like, is like Christ uh, in terms of his personality would be something that would move toward blessing. But if he's saying that he is like, uh, that he suffers like Christ, that would be something different. Um, so I would, I would try to find out what the artist meant and what, what this depiction is about. Um, that would be my own hunch. And, and I, I just can't say too much more about it with just not knowing the artist or the piece. So we we'll have to wait, check it into it. Let's uh, go to a call. We have Carla. And where are you calling from, Carla? I'm calling from Calgary, Alberta. Calgary. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Great. Anyway, yeah, I have a question. What would have happened if um, Adam and Eve didn't sin? What would a world be like? Well, you know, this would be something extremely special. Uh, a, a, matter of, a matter of fact, by the way, um, Carla, I, I hope all of the folks who live in your part of Canada uh, accept apologies from our weather forecasters who talk about Alberta uh, zephyrs as being the cold winds that aggravate us down here. But that's another issue. Uh, the, uh, no, Alberta clippers, that's it, Alberta clippers. Um, and so, um, at any rate, if you take a look, there are, there's a series of novels by C.S. Lewis. There's, they're uh, uh, it's called the Space Trilogy. And in two of them, one is called Out of the Silent Planet. Uh, and uh, in that one, you, you see the story of people, and for, as a matter of fact, in both of the first two, it's dealing with the question of what it would be like to be in a sinless place, place where people did not have original sin. And one of the key things that would have been the case, and Lewis, I think, has great insight into it, is that you would not have this ordered appetites for things. So, for instance, uh, there would be no such thing as, uh, you know, the sin of gluttony. You'd only want as much food as you needed, not just to eat food because it's there. It wouldn't be, uh, you know, doing this just out of some sort of uh, just pleasure, but you would eat what you need. Same thing would be true with sexuality. It wouldn't be something out of order. It would be in, for its purpose of procreation and of loving your spouse. 
and you wouldn't have desires for other people. You, same thing with property, that you wouldn't try just to ac accumulate more and more goods, but you just have the goods that you need. This would be the kind of, uh, uh, the, the key elements of what it would be like if there were not original sin. And that you wouldn't be driven by unjust anger to get back at people. That you would seek justice for its own sake and not for revenge. Those would be, th that, that absence of those disordered uh, affections and appetites, that would be the main thing. How the rest of history would go, that's something else. That's pure speculation. But it would be a lack of what we call concupiscence, that is disordered desires. All right, and then we have an email here from Mike. Dear Father Mitch, why is the death of Saul different between 1 and 2 Samuel? 1 Samuel 31 four, verses 4 through 5, Saul falls on his own sword and kills himself. However, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10, a man tells David that he killed Saul. Can you help, Mike? Yeah. Um, in 1 Samuel 31, it talks about how the Philistines fought against the Israelites and on Mount Gilboa. And the Israelites fled before the Philistines. Many fell on Mount Gilboa. And they overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of uh, Saul. And then they pressed upon Saul. Archers wounded him. And then he asked his armor bearer to draw your sword and thrust me through with it so that these uncircumcised may not come and thrust me through. It makes sport of me. But the armor bearer was unwilling, for he was terrified. So Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead. He also fell upon his sword and died with him. Now, that is a report by somebody who had been at the Battle of Gilboa. And in fact, if you go to Mount Gilboa, I've been there many times, um, you know, it's actually barren. And when a few people from a kibbutz tried to plant trees on Mount Gilboa, some of the rabbis came and took them out. They said, nope, this is cursed because of the death of Saul. And it was cursed by our ancestor David. So, nope, uh, no trees. So it's, it's, it's still barren. Meanwhile, in first, excuse me, in Second Samuel chapter one, verses one through ten, a messenger comes from the battle to David, who is living way in the south in Ziklag, and Ziklag was on the edge of uh, uh, Israel's land. It was actually more in Philistine territory, and it was, took him three days to get there and his clothes are torn, his dirt on his head. He tells uh, David that Saul was dead. David asks, how do you know that? Because I killed him. He asked me to. And David and his men lament. But then he says, how do you know this again? He said, well, I killed him. He asked me to do it. And notice he brought the crown and the arm bracelet that belonged to King Saul as proof. So he's someone who had gone over to Saul's body and had taken this crown and armlet and brought it to David, assuming that he would get a reward. And he, David, does not reward the man with some gifts as if saying, yeah, I killed Saul, so you could be king. David has the man killed because he claims that he killed Saul. And it may simply be this case. I know, 
the, the text doesn't say this. It take the, the text of first and second Samuel, first and second Samuel, which used to be one basic scroll. It, it, it's just one whole scroll. Uh, that they report the Philistines killing Saul and hang, decapitating him and hanging his body on the wall of a nearby city, an al a city allied with the Philistines. And the other report by the Amalekite, now you got to keep in mind, there's a st strong anti-Amalekite tendency in the Bible because they had attacked Moses and the Israelites right after the uh, Exodus. And then they had attacked David during the time of the battle where Saul died and David had killed them off. And now this Amalekite comes in thinking that he would get favor from David by telling us the, what the text is trying to communicate is that the Amalekite, probably not a good guy, doesn't come from good people. Uh, he's lying and he's just using this to get a reward from David. And David punishes him for doing that. Okay. All right. Uh, and then we have another email from Roger in Mora, Minnesota. Most people know immediately what scripture means, but few know what is meant by tradition. Do you have a succinct yet accurate definition? Yes, the tradition are the elements passed on by word of mouth from Christ and his apostles to the disciples of the apostles. And we see in their writings elements of the tradition. And they passed that on to the bishops who came after them. The bishops were the primary uh, means of passing on the tradition. But the tradition refers to apostolic tradition, tradition going back to the apostles, not things that came up like Christmas trees. That's not part of the apostolic tradition. That goes back only to St. Boniface in the early Middle Ages. But it's uh, the tradition that go back to the apostles. For instance, how we celebrate Mass. Then we start off with the penance, right? We have the readings from Scripture. And then after the reading of Scripture comes the offertory, consecration, and communion. That's, that structure is from tradition. And uh, also the list of books in the Bible. How do we know which books are in the Bible? Bible never says which books are in the Bible. We know it only from the tradition passed on to the bishops. So that's why it's extremely important. All right, we have to go. May the Lord bless you all and keep you throughout this great Advent and on this feast of St. Andrew. May God bless you and keep you and call you to follow him as Andrew did. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we can bring you this program and all the other programs only because the network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. Mm -hmm.